Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. Spike, what's going on? I'm having a great time, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this uh, this this eagle over your shoulder is uh, <laughs> it's it's inspiring and terrifying at the same time, yeah. which is probably yeah. the vibe and, you're and going for. Yeah, and as I told you before, the the real powerful thing about this is this is actually happening behind me. Like there's an actual, you know, we worry about so much, but once you realize there is in fact a giant shadow covered eagle watching over us all at all times, it it, it puts it in perspective. It puts in context, you know, where we really stand in the universe. Yeah. And how you get him to just sit there in space is pretty, I, I assume you're not going to give away the secrets, but that's cool. He's stoic. He's just very stoic. Yeah. yeah. So this, uh, we should have more conversations generally, but this particular one was inspired by a talk you gave just a couple days ago at Students for Liberty in yeah. DC. And, um, I, I am personally obsessed with, uh, with, uh, uh, Liberty values and, and how we might, um, translate our obscure philosophy into something that would actually resonate with people and you you hit a lot of those buttons for me so I want to I want to definitely get into um, the common sense nature of of these core values that we have like these these are not libertarian values they're human values yeah um, and and how you're applying that in your work and then I will definitely ask you some gotcha questions about libertarian politics because that's who we do that's who we are yeah. No, yeah. I'm here for the gotcha questions. I'll do the other stuff and talk about how we can spread liberty and, and blah, blah, blah. But I'm here for the gotcha questions. Yeah. And we'll, we'll clip those and it'll, it'll go viral for sure. So, <laughs> so that what, um, this, this was a speech about, uh, mutual respect. Um, yeah. if I don't want to spoil your punchline for you, but what, what was the inspiration for, for the story that you told? Yeah, so I, I've been for a while now trying to figure out how can we encapsulate our ideas into something that intrinsically makes sense to even a seven or eight year old. You know, how how can we take the idea, the 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 not just the ethic uh, behind libertarianism, but the um, the the consequence of it, like how how it makes our lives better, the the inherent solution behind it, into something that basically everyone already agrees with. And I came across it when I started looking at a lot of what the advocates for self-government were doing. Um, and they were talking about something called the principle of human respect. And at it, it first, it, it sounded a bit like a uh, uh, like a bit of a platitude. I'm like, yeah, OK, yeah, respect, whatever. But then I realized something in, in, in listening to what they were saying about it is that it's it's really it boils down to we intrinsically treat human beings with a level of respect for them as individuals that we don't afford to anything else. Um, we have an intrinsic level of respect that someone else is an individual human being. And when I say respect, I don't mean necessarily that you like that person or you know uh, believe in what they're doing or respect their opinion about anything or even know or care about them. But you're not going to stomp on them the same way you would stomp on an insect when you're walking down the street because you respect that they're an individual human being. Uh, you're, you're not going to treat them the same way you would an animal, even an animal that you like or care for or uh, or you know want to see do you know live well because you recognize that they're an individual human being that's deserving of respect. And, and what I said at Students for Liberty is everyone that was there who had traveled to get there had to come into relatively close contact with thousands or tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of people if they had to go to multiple airports to get there. And at no point did they, they, they probably for the entire time had at least a, a reasonable expectation that they were going to make it to where they were going safely and get back safely, even though they were around hundreds of thousands of people, the vast majority of whom were total strangers. They had no idea what they were about, what their values were, what their aims were or anything else. And the reason they had that reasonable expectation is because intrinsically we expect and provide to others that, uh, that basic level of individual human respect. It is that intrinsic level of respect that humanity needs, that all of us need as individuals and, and as a group to be able to thrive, to be able to be uh, harmonious, to be able to be prosperous. 
But we put that expectation of human respect aside when it's the government. And even though those government officials, those politicians, those police officers, those you know uh, government employees and so forth, they're human beings just like us. If they were acting outside of their capacity as a government official, we would never tolerate them doing the exact same thing they do as a government official. And so what I'm trying to do both with the work that we do with You Are the Power and just generally in talking about issues is kind of pull that veil back and say, no, these are still just people. And in order for us to be able to function correctly as a society and thrive and live our best way that we can live, we have to expect them to respect us as individual human beings the same way we would those exact same people when they're not acting in their capacity as a government official. And, and it, is, it is something that is so intrinsic that I love talking about it because people will, you'll see the gears moving where they're like, oh, wow, I never really thought about it. But yeah, that's how I've been acting my entire life. And it, it really does drive home what libertarianism is. And, and uh, it's been really incredible to, to watch that unfold as, I, as I've been talking about it with folks. Yeah, it's the, like the best response to that story is, well, yeah, of course. Um, and I'm <laughs> almost like um, people are almost insulted that you're repeating the obvious, but yes. it, it probably wasn't explicitly obvious until people started thinking a little bit about it. Um, you know, when I was, uh, um, I don't know if you know this part of this story, but um, when I was thinking about this stuff, um, some 10 years ago, I guess now, um, I was listening to Vernon Smith, the Nobel laureate, and, and just one of the smartest, most insightful people I know, just spontaneously riffing on Adam Smith and the theory of moral sentiments. And your, mm. your talk reminded me of something, and I, I, wanna, I wanna quibble with the, the meaning of respect and, and drill down a little bit more on, the, yeah. on some of these words that I think are our words that we've perhaps sacrificed as people have, have corrupted the meaning of them. But yeah. Ad, Adam Smith talked about, in the theory of moral sentiments, he talks about um, fellow love, which is, is uh, I think we would call it empathy or even sympathy for other people that you can, mm -hmm. you can actually imagine the world that they're in and the struggles that they have and, yeah. and, and the needs and hopes and dreams for their families. And, and all the things that that we we hold for ourselves, we we would apply those to other people, and and that that respect that you're describing is just um, an appreciation that we're all humans, we're all trying to figure stuff out, and we're we're all trying to get along. Um, but you know, the other half of that, that's a, you know, everyone likes to point out, and I agree with this, that without the theory of moral sentiments, you wouldn't have the wealth of nations, you wouldn't have a functioning market economy, you wouldn't have yep. peaceful cooperation yep. and 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 intolerance and, and, and all of these things that, that we understand only comes from freedom. So it's it's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. You, All the people that came to the Students for Liberty Conference had a reasonable expectation that that their, their fellows would not hurt them or take their stuff yep. because they, they live in a society free enough to allow for that kind of behavior to emerge, I think. Mm -hmm. So, and I, yep. so yep. like the the you, if you when you dig into the theory of uh, of socialism and practice, you can you can find the most horrific inhuman behavior by human against human, neighbor against neighbor, yep. uh, countrymen against countrymen, and it's because they were stripped of of their freedom and their humanity. So. This, 100%. this to me is like uh, this is the secret sauce. We need to we need to connect with people, um, and I want them to say, "Well, yeah, of course." Instead of uh, sort of vomiting out uh, ad nauseum the non-aggression principle, because I don't even know what that means. Well, and the thing is, the non-aggression principle, which I mean, I've, I've heard a few different versions of it, but I, I like the most distilled version is basically, "Don't hurt people, don't take their stuff," um, but the non-aggression principle is sort of the the i guess moral uh, output of individual human respect it's saying we're not going to hurt people we're not going to take their stuff broadly speaking and someone might say why 
And now you have to say what? Uh, well, because you shouldn't. OK, why? Why shouldn't I? Like if, if you really want someone who's going to get pedantic and, and, you know, apply the I'm not assuming that we shouldn't hurt people and shouldn't take their stuff. Uh, the beauty of the individual human respect of this principle is to be able to say to them, well, why didn't you stomp on people today? Why didn't you harm anyone today? Yeah, to some extent, there's a, a fear, maybe a fear of punishment or a fear of, of, of retribution or, or, you know, that they'll fight back or whatever. But that's not what's driving the average person who's not a, a psychopath or a sociopath. They're doing it because they just have a basic level of respect that not for that person necessarily, but that they're a person. And that's the kind of respect I'm talking about. It's it's it is an intrinsic thing that we don't even really think about. And again, the people that don't have that respect are the people that we all regard as a threat to the rest of us. Um, we talk a lot about high trust societies, you know, the places where, you know, you could leave your bike on the sidewalk without it, you know, without it being chained to anything. And you can go in the store and do whatever you want and come out and you know that the the uh, the bike's still going to be there. But, you know, we talk about high trust, trust of what? Trust that we can have a reasonable expectation that everyone else in that area, that society is going to respect us as an, an individual human being and not harm us accordingly. Now, I'm sure in those places, and I, I keep using the bug analogy, but I'm sure many insects get stomped both accidentally and intentionally during that time. It's not because those people are, are bad. It's because they don't look at that. They often don't even see the insect, but if they do, they're not looking at the insect the same way they look at a person. They're not going, oh, wow, this insect is an individual insect and I have to make sure I don't step on it. This is It's a very basic intrinsic thing. And we look at the places where there's a lack of human respect relative to other places, high crime areas, war zones, places that have been taken over by the worst authoritarians, and everyone's suffering terribly as a direct result of that. And it's as you said, the first thing any authoritarian has to do, communist, a fascist, any of this, the first thing they have to do in order to be able to get people okay with this mass tragedy that's going to happen as policy is to dehumanize the people they're doing it to. And in the case of, of communism and socialism, they essentially dehumanize or at least de-individualize everyone. You are now no longer an individual. You are a part of a collective. And so whatever thing happens to you is for the good of, of the collective. And that's why you see the more collectivized a society is and the less individualized it is, the more they basically beat that intrinsic level of respect out of people. And as a result, there is much more suffering than we would ever tolerate in, an, in a place where we have more of that individual respect. Free the People is embarking on our most ambitious project to date to document and expose the lies behind the greatest public health failure in my lifetime. We're talking to insiders with firsthand knowledge of the government's role in funding, creating, and then covering up the COVID-19 virus in our exclusive new documentary series, The Cover-Up. But I need your help. We won't get to the bottom of this scandal alone, so I'm asking viewers to crowdsource any information that could be helpful to our investigation. If you're watching this, you already know what the government did during lockdowns was unforgivable. Help us get to the truth and prevent it from ever happening again. To get involved, go to freethepeople.org slash coverup. That's freethepeople.org slash coverup. The truth is out there. So the, the, the uh, libertarians are very good at focusing on the, the individualism, which is one half of that coin that you're yep. describing. Yep. And, and I've, I've obsessed for, I don't know how long, forever, about as someone that was very much inspired by Ayn Rand's novels and, and her sort of primal scream against collectivism as... As a, yeah. as a young woman who fled the Bolshevik Revolution and left everything, including her family, behind, I can sort of empathize with why she really focused on, uh, you know, leave me alone. I'm going to pursue my own life. I will not be detained. No one's going to yep, tell me yep. what to do. And and th those are those are fine values. And and most libertarians are very good at expressing those opinions all the time. But yep. the the other half of the coin, like collectivism, wipes out the individual, but individualism. Um, creates robust community. And we're not so good 
at explaining the robust community part of that, that the mutual cooperation. Um, and I, I do think respect um, can, respect to me is, is, a, is, a, is a higher bar to clear than just sort of tolerance and, and trade and, and cooperating. Because um, at, yep. some, at some point there's mutual respect because you actually appreciate the other person there's yep. trust, which is a pretty high bar. Um, and I, I worked this out with Deirdre McCloskey at some point. Um, I think at the top of this hierarchy of values is love. And that is that that is the highest, highest bar to clear. Um, and, you know, one of the one of the mistakes that that some of our um, socialist, democratic socialist, progressive friends somehow think that that love is something that can be legislated, imposed and and yep. demanded of other people, and I think that's not all, not only silly but but dangerous. Yeah, I, I think very often what they're calling love is more of a paternalism. It's like I love you, and therefore I'm going to give you everything that I'm pretty sure you need. I because I know better than you. Again, that that's all inherent in what they're saying is I know better than you, and so because I love you, I'm going to make sure that you're well taken care of, and I'm also going to make sure that you don't step out of line too much, and that you you do the things that I deep down know better than you you need. So it's it it might be. Uh, it, it, to them, it might feel like love, but I'm sure to many uh, abusers and victimizers, what they do to their victims feels like love because there's a there's a, a built in hubris and, and a paternalism there um, and, and a lack of regard for that person as an individual to make their choices. And I'm glad you brought up the, the individualism and community part. Individualism to the uninitiated very often sounds like we're saying you're on your own. Every man is an island. And, you know, if anything happens, it's every man for themselves and, and you just got to figure it out. We are inherently a, a social species. We are social primates. We the reason that we uh, have bad feelings when we do something bad to each other, it's theorized by many that that's because of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution uh, of us to have these bad feelings because of what we're doing to others in our social group. So I mean that you can't escape that 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 we are not we are not individual islands all to ourselves. And you know every solution is something that we can take care of ourselves. And of course not. And and no one wants to live that way. Actually, I should rephrase that. I think there are some people particularly some that are drawn to libertarianism who may fool themselves into thinking that um, they don't actually apply it that way because it's impossible to just be on your own and never uh, have any real interaction with anyone else uh, in any way. But I think they kind of might wish that that is uh, the case. And I, I do think because of our messaging, which is often mis, uh, misapplied or misunderstood, we do attract uh, some folks who are just don't like other people. Um, and, and, and we see that they're, they're, you know, they're, there's a level of, uh, uh, misanthropy there. You know, th these are people that don't want to be around other people. But that's not what we're saying. And it, it never was. What we're saying is that by empowering and respecting, really just respecting individuals to be able to make their own choices, they are naturally, we are all naturally going to make choices along with other individuals, and that that's what community is. That's what society is. That's what a neighborhood is. Uh, frankly, on a, on a greater scale, that can be what a country is. Uh, it doesn't have to be some arbitrary uh, political boundary drawn around a geographical area. It can be people who have common cause and common values and respect each other as individuals and work together as such. And, and that's, that is what the foundation is. And again, whenever we see a lack of that human respect, things are worse. Yeah. And that's the common thread. You know, people will go, well, you know, uh, um, uh, economics applied this way turns into fascism and economics that applied this way turns into communism. And, you know, it, it, these thing, things seem so different, but they're not. At their core, the one thing that they all share in common, war, communism, fascism, all of these things are there was a great lack of human respect and people were either completely dehumanized or they were grouped together so much as to no longer be respected as individuals or sometimes both. And things are worse as a result. The telling the story of, of the beautiful things that happen when people are free enough to cooperate yeah. and build things, you, you start to realize quite quickly that um, you, you can't actually do it alone. You can't do everything that that we have done as a as a complex society 
without yep. a division of labor and without um, tremendous diversity of, of talents and backgrounds. And, yeah. and it's, it's, it's sort of funny to me or tragic that we've somehow lost that narrative to, to collectivists who don't respect any of those things. Like, you know, the, the progressive left prattles on about diversity, but they, they don't mean it. They, they, no, they, at all. they quite mean the opposite of that. And, and, and we, we do have this philosophy that, that can really see the power of, of, of tremendous amount of diversity um, because it leads to more cooperation and it leads to more empathy as in, in the words of Adam Smith, which I think does get to respect. You know, I have all these culture wars going on there right now. We libertarians have the only answer, which is, is actually a pathway by which you can understand others that, that on first glance might totally freak you out. Like I don't, I don't get that person. I don't get the choices they're making. Um, and you could either use politics to force them not to behave that way, um, disrespecting them in your words, and yeah. or you could actually imagine a world where we could cooperate. Um, you know, maybe we choose not to cooperate and that's fine too. Um, but, but this is our story and we need to take it back. It is. It is our story. And it it also, again, why I've, I've I still will talk about the nap and I will still talk about when someone asks about, you know, some of our philosophical underpinnings of libertarianism and things like that. People ask me what the invisible hand is, things like that. Like it, it's good to to talk about those things when there's an interest in it. But if I bring up to someone who's worried about you know, uh, it, the average person out there who's like, you know, healthcare is getting more and more and more expensive. Uh, I see all these other rich countries out there. It looks like their health care is free. Aren't we the richest country on earth? I'm worried that if I get really sick, I'm going to lose everything. What's the libertarian answer to that? And we immediately go to our inside baseball terms like the 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 the, the uh, you know, the, the invisible hand of the market. What they're hearing is we're going to take away your health care or whatever other thing they asked us, you know, what we how we were going to deal with it and replace it with magic. And if we tell them, if we if we add for good measure that we're going to leave them alone, that sounds like neglect to them. Because, again, the the mainstream discourse about these things is that if you don't have, as you put it, a political solution being applied to it, then there's not going to be any solution. And so anyone saying the political solution is to get out of it entirely, it's especially if we're also talking about individualism and all of this stuff to the uninitiated who don't understand at its core, who we aren't explaining at its core what it is we're trying to do. It sounds like we're saying you're all on your own. Uh, it'll magically work itself out. And if it doesn't, I don't particularly care. And if instead we lead with saying the reason that, it, and I'll use healthcare as an example, the reason healthcare is so expensive is because the policies that are in place ensure that it will be expensive, not just for you as an individual patient, but to the taxpayers. We pay more per taxpayer. Uh, we pay yeah, more per taxpayer per patient than almost any other country on earth. And then you have to pay about two or three times that out of pocket. And it was set up that way intentionally by politicians who had so little respect for you as an individual that they set these things up to line the pockets of the crony sponsors that keep them in government in the uh, you know big pharma and, and, and big healthcare conglomerates and, and insurance companies and everything else. And they saw you as a political tool uh, to uh, to get them the, the the money that they wanted. And if they can make your health care bad enough, they can convince you that the government should just take it over entirely and then they control you completely. And the reason they're doing that, the reason they're putting you in this terrible situation where you have to choose between terrible government rationed health care and marginally better but wildly over expensive health care is because they don't respect you as an individual. We do, which is why we would never use you as a political problem. We would get rid of those absurd regulations that drove up the cost of health care. We would get rid of the uh, uh, the certificate of need laws and cost plus legislation and mandated insurance red tape and everything else and the taxes on health care itself that drive it up so that you can't afford it or have to make rationing choices yourself. And in doing so, you won't have to worry about health care anymore because you'll be able to afford it and it will be far better and far more dynamic uh, and you'll have far better health outcomes. We all will because we respect you enough to realize that we can fix this better than government can. That's how you talk about health care. That's how you talk about education. That's how you talk about public safety, immigration, foreign policy and everything else. If you start at 
They're doing this to you because they don't respect you. We do, and here's our solution. Now, not only are you not sounding like someone who doesn't care about them and wants to leave them alone to, to their own defenses out in this you know wild world and everything else, you instead sound like someone who absolutely cares about them, who understands this far better than anyone they've heard from, and who actually is presenting a viable solution that makes sense to them. But you have to start with, I actually care about you. Yeah. But so like, uh, I think it was four or five years ago now, I was at a different Students for Liberty conference and there was a competition amongst uh, students to um, communicate uh, the libertarian position on healthcare. And, and keep in mind, these, these young people, all of whom were rock stars, they were specifically curated because they were the communicators. Right. And, and the first guy that, to get up on stage, PowerPoint, spreadsheet he could prove to me he had all the data the lot his logic was impeccable and first of all you couldn't even read the spreadsheet it was so filled with numbers but <laughs> but he just he just walked through the economic logic of of why government funded health care is a disaster for yes. people um and i'm i'm probably picking on this person i don't even remember his name anymore but probably failed to mention in, in this entire presentation that the only reason we should care about that spreadsheet is because people are dying because government health care is preventing that mom from getting her child the, 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 the support she needs. Right. And, right. and at the same time, I was um, part of this, this progressive working group, um, and I was, I was sort of the, the token libertarian, and, and I, to this day I have a lot of friends in this group, but they don't have spreadsheets. They get up and tell the story about the mom and the yeah. child who is being denied mm -hmm. care, and everybody yes. in the room is crying. Yep. And there's no way, like after after she tells that story, there's no way you're gonna like drill down on whether or not the the numbers add up in her healthcare plan. You want you want to save that kid. So yep. I, th I think I'm I'm segueing to to something implied in 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 your entire speech and everything you've said so far is um one one of the libertarian diseases is is logic and 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 in my case i'm an econ i'm a recovering economist so i'm constantly <laughs> sliding yeah. into economic logic in hopes that someone will yes. understand uh -huh. that, that we can't spend our way to oblivion um yes but we got we got a lead with with emotionally compelling arguments we got to personalize mm -hmm. it we got to use these these sort of universally accepted values that that um, are certainly commonplace amongst most americans and yep. you know what is that balance between emotion and and logic because i feel like libertarians have leaned 100 percent into logic and and logic and reason isn't the yeah the path to connect with most people yeah, no, we we have uh, we have really leaned into the idea that we can craft over time. We can craft the perfectly logical argument on whatever subject, and it will be so airtight that everyone else will look at the argument, that PowerPoint with you know the the you know uh, leftist beam level of word density on every slide, and they'll look at it and they'll say, "My God, this thing is perfect." I can't, I can't find a single place where I can uh, argue against this unless I were to engage in some kind of logical fallacy and I would never do that. Honey, change our registration to libertarian. We're all, we're all libertarians now. Like that's not real. It worked for us and it's not for nothing that libertarians are disproportionately well represented among the, uh, the neuro atypical community, I'll put it that way. And we straight up refer to everyone else as normies. We get it. We get that we think differently than most people. Everyone applies on every subject, on every, every day, on every issue. We apply a certain level of intellect, intuition, and emotion. You know, the intellect is what, are, what do we think about this argument? What do we think about the, the logic and the facts behind it? The intuition is just sort of a gut feeling of, do I trust this person? Do, does this make sense at first blush? It's almost a subconscious thing. There's not much thinking involved. And then emotion, how do we feel about it? Well, libertarians typically are really, really high on the intellect part and, uh, and a slightly lower on the emotion, but not as low as we'd like to pretend and uh, almost no intuition. We are not picking up on social cues.
we are not figuring out that uh, and I say we, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a, 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 I guess, recovering libertarian autist as well, um, that the reality is um, we're not connecting with people. And we can call them sheeple and say that they're emotional and stupid or whatever, or we could acknowledge that we're, that's like most people. So call them stupid if you want. That's how most people are. Most people are far more concerned with how do I feel about this? Do other people agree with this? And even within that group, there's another group of people that we get frustrated with who say, prove that, the, that this works. Like, OK, this makes sense on paper, but, you know, show me an example of that. And we get frustrated with that, too. We're not consequentialists. Well, no, but most people are. Most people are either consequentialists or they're just seeking consensus. Do, do people in my peer group agree with this? Or am I hearing this from other people? Or they're just purely emotional. Do I think you care about me? I mean, Bernie Sanders can get away with the most economically illiterate nonsense because he's got a good shtick of telling everyone he cares about them and, and what's happening happening to them is unacceptable. And he'll very often correctly point out real problems that people are facing. He then proposes things that will make them far worse, but he leads with that emotion. And, and like you said, I mean, we can show up with the PowerPoint with all the information on it and it will attract other people like us. There aren't enough of us. Other people who are like us are a very small percentage of the population. And it, it, there's a, um, a theory called the theory of diffusion of innovation or diffusion of ideas. And it sort of creates this bell curve of the population. And at the beginning of that bell curve is the innovators. Uh, the innovators are the people who look at a problem and say, oh, I got a solution for that. I'm going to figure out a solution for that and then tell people about it. The next small part of that bell curve is uh, first adopters. So they see a solution and they look around for the newest idea. They may not come up with it themselves, but they look for the newest thing and say, and it, they adopt it very quickly and start telling others about it. Libertarians tend to be innovators and early adopters, but that's a very small sliver of the population. Most people fall into either the early majority, which are people who want to see if it works and if they think they can trust you, or the late majority who are almost entirely driven by consensus. Does the early majority agree with this? Do other people in my peer group agree with this? We need to be talking to the early and late majorities. We need to be talking to the vast majority of people who are not thinking like we are. And it doesn't mean we water down our message. It doesn't mean that we pander or make things up that we don't agree with. It just means that we structure how we're saying it by leading with, we care about this too. Because frankly, if we didn't care about it, we wouldn't be talking about it. But some of us are so cerebral that we never even say the I care part because of course we care. We wouldn't be talking about it otherwise. Other people need to see that and we need to demonstrate it. At Kibbe on Liberty, freedom is a lifestyle 24 seven, something you live and breathe and wear every day. If that describes you, you need the very best Liberty swag in the market today just like this shirt I happen to be wearing. Go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and check out our exciting merch. You too can love liberty and look cool. Which seems like uh, a great way to tee up uh, the experiments that you're pursuing with your new organization. You are the power, you're well branded right there. Um, yeah. is, is the one-eyed <laughs> eagle your mascot? I'm, I'm curious about that. Uh, the one-eyed eagle, um, I'd like to take a step back. The earth is flat. Not only is there an ice wall around it and a turtle under it, but there's an eagle above it too. So the, he's not affiliated with any nonprofit or anything else. Okay. I, I know I'm exposing a truth that the media wouldn't have you know, and I appreciate you uh, you know, helping me in spreading that truth. Um, no, You Are the Power uh, started as, uh, I feel like I need to say I'm not actually a flat earther after that. <laughs> That's the part you're going to no, clip. I'm, I'm clipping that for sure. <laughs> Good. You know what? Just do that. Actually, the rest of this, you can just put in the tin. That's the part you lead with. Spike yeah, Cohen's yeah. a flat earther. No. So during the 2020 VP campaign, I'm going around the country and I literally I think I visited 37 states or something like that. Um, and this was during you know lockdowns and COVID restrictions. So we're often just straight up violating whatever the, the rules are there. We don't even often know what the rules are there. We're just showing up on the bus or you know coming in on the plane and doing an event and, and, and then leaving. And you know, people would come up to these events and come up to speak with me. I'd try to talk with as many of the people that showed up as I could. And they would very often come to me with issues that they were facing personally or in their local government or in their state government. And I would say, you know, wow, that's terrible. And, and you know, I'm running for a federal office. So even if 
lightning struck 15 times in the same spot and we actually won, I wouldn't be able to do anything about this. And I, I, I don't have any ability right now to, but I can try to find some local libertarians in the area that can try to help you. Um, and uh, and I would reach out to, you know, send out emails and or, or you know, text people if I knew them in the area and, and try to do that. And I realized something. <clears throat> The campaign was largely being run from the bottom up. It was the locals that were that were putting together these events. They may be getting directions from the national campaign, but they were the ones really doing it. And that really speaks to what we talk about with decentralization. It's the people on the ground that know what need to be done, not someone centrally planning it in a you know a, the the, uh, the HQ of, a, of an organization. And then the other thing that I saw was that there are people that need help right now. And because other libertarians would show up to these events and they were wildly frustrated. They're like, you know, we show up every two to four years for these campaigns and we almost never win anything. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just a lot of effort. And, uh, you know, we have all this energy and we want to do things. And but we don't know how like we don't we don't. We're, we're doing something that feels futile. So I'm, I'm showing up and I got one group of people saying we want something to do to help people and another group of people showing up saying we need help. And I thought, what if we put this together? And so starting in 2021, as a proof of concept, we picked out some causes that we found out about people that were being abused and disrespected by their local governments. And we organized the libertarians we had in our, in our kind of informal network of activists and volunteers across the country to help them. And we thought, you know, before we you know, become a, a 501c3 and before we start taking donations, let's just see, is this even going to work? Is there anything here? And there was. It was incredible. We were able to help people. We were able to spread the, the core libertarian message. Um, and we were able to uh, we were able to, to help people now, not in some distant utopian future where we've taken over the world and are now leaving everyone alone. And uh, and we kept libertarians excited and gave them something positive to do. We replaced this culture of losing that we have within the liberty movement where we just expect we're going to lose and have already become black pilled about it. And I've already started calling everyone morons because of it. And instead, I'm giving people a culture of living. Here's a goal we can actually accomplish right now. And here's another one. And here's another one. And here's another one. And, and getting them prepared for this terrible things happening. Here's the solution. We're going to win. And in doing all of these things, we saw even as the proof of concept that it was wildly successful. So we became a formal organization in 2022. Um, we officially launched at the, the Reno convention in 22. And, uh, and since then, we now have uh, around 3000 members across the country. We have worked on dozens of causes across the country. We have helped reunite families and get people out of jail that were you know, booked on phony charges and stopped people's homes from being stolen by zoning boards. And we, we're, we're uncovering essentially child trafficking operations that some of these child protective services in some of these states are doing. We're helping find murderers in cold cases that have gone unsolved. We're doing all this incredible stuff and we're doing it because we're giving libertarians something to do with their idle hands. We're showing the community that, that we care about them and we're giving both of them solutions and a call to action on how they can help with it. And it, it's been absolutely incredible. By the way, that's the, that is the, the core of the philosophy that it's it's more than decentralization. It's local knowledge, um, yep. turbocharged by cooperation and and yep. you know creating essentially a division of labor. This is what we supposedly believe, but yes. what, but we are we have been captured by all of these top down institutions that mm -hmm. there's there's always a super smart guy or girl that is so smart that they have a central plan to impose on the community. Yes, but and I've I've been to some of the events when you were running for vice president, and it's all local. Like it's, um, if if anything, national sort of screws up the the process by by imagining that they know better than than what that community can do. Um, so what is the um, and obviously all of the examples you use of of uh, local government tyrants disrespecting people um, that that fits with the the sort of rage against the machine um, sweet spot that libertarians have. We're, we're very good at being pissed off at, yes. at government tyranny, and, and righteously so. I, 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 don't, I don't take a second, um, second seat to anyone on, on righteous indignation with, with the, the violence of government. But, yeah. but what you're teasing at, and I don't know if you've experimented with this, but, but actual community building, actual um, community organizing that that gives people, you know, instead of demanding that they pick up their family and move to New Hampshire, 
you're suggesting that that perhaps there's there's a sense of belonging in this community that just won this beautiful fight uh, freeing a family yeah. from child protective services have you taken it to the next step is that something you're interested in doing that's actually what we are doing let me give a little bit more detail on how we work on these causes because so far i've just been saying we're helping people but i'm not really providing how we do so the first step is we find out about these causes we and it, it used to be that we would look for them at this point it's like drinking from a fire hose we have probably uh, i don't know how many hundreds of causes brought to our attention in in a given few months um and so we start to we vet them to see are they legit you know very often they're not in fact most of the causes brought to us turn out not to be what they said it was when we start looking into it. Um, and then is this something we can actually build a movement around? You know, if you got a, a, a parking ticket, but you weren't really parked there. Yeah, that's not right. And you have a case and you should fight it. But I can't build a movement in your community around fight for the parking ticket guy. So it has to be really like, you know, is this something where a a person is having their livelihood stolen from them, their business stolen, their home stolen, their family, their children being taken from them. And if it's something like that, and if it is legit and the, the facts are on their side, then we go into the next step, which is organizing. And the first thing we do now is we reach out to uh, those local officials that are involved in this and we let them know that we're on to them and that uh, before we ever go public on anything. Uh, we send them emails saying, hey, we're with this organization. This is what we do. This is what you're doing that got our attention. Stop doing it. We say it a little bit nicer than that, but that's what we say. And we make sure that we've got our social media and our, our website on those emails. So when they're reading them, they can click on them and see what we've uh, done to other officials who, who didn't back off and do the right thing. And we're finding that a good bit of the time, increasingly so, they just back off. We never even have to tell anyone about it. If that doesn't work, then the next step is we alert our membership and then we alert the public through our you know viral videos and, and content that we put out about this cause and about what's happening. And it is very very, very heavy on the emotion. I don't lead with, you know, the the policy failure behind whatever terrible thing. I lead with that family, that business, that person living in that home. I lead with the thing that's going to make the average, the normiest normie normie that you could ever think of being normie to watch this and go, this is terrible. Someone has to do something. And then we give them something to do. Instead of saying this is terrible and it's a policy failure and this is why I'm a libertarian and you should be just as mad as I am. Instead, I say, here's how we can fix this. These are the officials that are doing this. In fact, now we say, go to this page on our website. It will have all the details with the newest updates on it. So if you're watching this video and it's from two weeks ago, you can go to this page and see the newest updates on the cause. Uh, it will have the list of the uh, officials that you can contact, their email address, and if we can get it, their phone number. And here is a template you can use when you're emailing them or calling them that has all the details of the case. You can fill in your name. You can fill in anything else you want, but you can use this template so that you're you're talking to them intelligently and not just saying, I hate you, you're a bad person. And we will keep you updated on this. And here's where you can sign up to find out more and to keep being updated on it. And what we find is both the public and that community, because we use our, our local members, reach out to Facebook groups and other people in that direct community to get them involved. That usually, most of the time, if the first set of warning emails didn't work, that works. Every once in a, in, in a while, we're finding less so now, but every once in a while, they'll dig their heels in. And they'll say, ah, this is just a bunch of keyboard warriors. You know, yeah, I'm not used to getting 6,000 emails telling me to, you know, leave this family alone. But what are they going to do? Like, you know, most of these people are, are not even in my state or in my county or my constituency or whatever. I, I, I don't care about this. Then when we have like 100 people show up to their next city council meeting, the vast majority of whom are in their constituency, telling them the exact same thing they've been hearing in thousands of emails, that's when they, if they didn't back off before that, that's when they back off now. And at this point, for our causes in 2023, we have had essentially a 100% success rate. If the first set of emails didn't stop them, uh, if the, if the, uh, if the, um, uh, the, the, you know, public online, I, I call it the cyberbullying method, but I'm being told I need to stop saying that. But if the, if the cyberbullying doesn't work, then Cy the in real life bullying, Cyber, Cyber persuasion. persuasion. See, I knew you would. If anyone would have the right way to say it, I'm now going to have to change my shirts to say cyber persuade the government. I'm sure those will sell just as well. Yeah. But um, if that doesn't work, then we show up. And in fact, there are some videos of me showing up to city council meetings. You'll notice that there are less of those more recently because we're increasingly not having to do that. The first set of emails often uh, very uh, increasingly works. And if that doesn't work more often than not, the public outcry and the and the the 
repeated hundreds and thousands of emails from people saying, you're doing the wrong thing, do this instead. That's usually enough to do it. In doing so, and in making those connections with the local community, we're building community and we're building it in multiple facets. And in some ways we're actually connecting communities. When we get a local community involved in a specific cause, they're now organized with that. They're now seeing that you were the power is the group essentially leading this um, with both local activists and a network of activists across, at this point, the planet. But we also connect them with the rest of our community, because, again, they're all doing this online, usually, if we don't have to do the in-person part. And they're building an actual community of people that want to keep doing this. So when they become members or they sign up for our newsletter to find out about it and we win on that one, we say, hey, here's our next one. Here's the next thing we're fighting on and here's how you can help. And what we're finding is more and more people are joining us who probably don't even know what libertarianism is. We recently had a training workshop. We offer training, uh, member, members only training to uh, members um, and membership is free. You don't have to pay for the training, um, but we offer training on different things. And at the end, the, the, uh, the trainer was doing a Q&A and one of the people said, yeah, I, you keep mentioning um, something about Spike um, and how Spike likes this and Spike would do this. What's a Spike? What is Spike? What is that? And they couldn't have been happier because it means there are now people joining this that have no clue who I even am. They probably don't even know what libertarianism is, but yet they're some of the most effective liberty activists, even though they don't even realize it yet. And they are talking and adopting our principles, the core principle behind libertarianism and implementing it on a regular basis and training to find out more about how to do it. And they don't even necessarily haven't even heard of libertarianism yet. That's how we get people into this. Think of the sheer number of people who espouse socialist ideas or at least democratic socialist ideas, whatever the key difference is there. They don't call themselves socialists. They just heard someone say, yeah, everything should be free and we should be providing for people and we're a rich country and you know the rich shouldn't have all, it's not fair for the rich to have all this and the poor to have nothing. And they've said, yeah, I agree with that. And so they started saying it too. They don't call themselves ideological socialists. They don't understand the, the concept behind uh, the Hegelian dialectic or, or seizing the means of production or any of that. They don't know any of that. They just heard something that sounded good and they went with it. Let's give them something that sounds good that they can go with. Have you had any local organizers call you up and say, yeah, uh, Spike, my people don't know who you are and I'm afraid if you show up, you might scare them away? No, that's no. never happened. It's not. No, no. In fact, but we have had people that are like, wow, you know, I've and increasingly more so I am essentially as the head of the organization, I'm basically the cheerleader in chief and the um, and and uh, also, in uh, you know, when you run a nonprofit, you can laugh at this. I'm basically a professional beggar as well. I'm just asking people to, to help fund what we're doing. Um, the actual groundwork on a day to day basis is being done by our core staff and our regional organizing volunteer team and our, our state and local organizers and just our general membership. But what they will often get is people saying, wow, I went to your Twitter. I went to Spike's Twitter or, or you know, went, went to their Facebook or whatever. And man, you got some pretty wild ideas on stuff. And they'll say, yeah, we're just applying what we think about this to that. And so we've heard that that's actually facilitated some conversations about things that they thought, wow, completely privatized healthcare. Wow. No restrictions on gun ownership. Wow. That housing regulations get rid of them almost entirely. And, but when they hear that, yeah, that's, the bad things you're seeing right now are what happened when you when you allow government to disrespect you by over regulating and over taxing and overburdening you. We apply that to everything, not just this cause. So it's actually a great opening way because we're leading with showing them we care. We understand the problem. We have a solution. And here's how you can join us. Then when they see the other more extreme sounding stuff, they're at least open to hearing about it. But if we lead with the extreme sounding stuff, coupled with you're an individual and, and we're going to leave you alone and the magic hand will solve it, we sound like we're insane. You're on your own. We're not going to help you. you. You know, no, we don't care about any kind of safety or protection. And, uh, you know, if, if it doesn't work out, uh, it doesn't matter. And all I care about is this giant graph filled with facts that you're never that your eyes glaze over when you look at it. We look like psychopaths. We look like insane people to them. And so when we do it this way, uh, we're able to actually connect people. The other thing that happens is, especially at the local level, 
we see that more community gets built within that local area. So like, for example, we worked on a cause where a lady uh, zoning board was um, trying to steal a lady's home because her, her, her steal her property because her home burnt down. Her insurance company gave her a, a camper for her and her family to live in while they were rebuilding the home. And uh, which, you know, with the with the insurance process, it could take over a year for that to happen. And the zoning board said, oh, uh, technically you have two residences on your property and it's not zoned for that. So we're gonna fine you however many thousand dollars a day and it, or you can just give us the property and then you won't have to pay anything. We found out about it and we got justice for them. But the other thing that happened, they, they, they now live in their new home that has been rebuilt and the zoning board backed off and all of that. But the other thing that happened was that the local community found out this was happening and they not only joined us in, in our partners in that area uh, to fight back against it and to demand that they stop, but they also brought them baked goods and they brought them uh, you know, like towels and blankets and clothes and things to replace everything they'd lost in the home fire. And those people now have a far stronger connection to their community and their community to them out of what started as a tragedy. And we see that a lot. We see when we work with charities that have been feeding homeless people for years with no problem. And then one day the uh, city council decides they want to have some multi-million dollar deal with a nonprofit. So they go around to all the other charities and tell them, if you ever feed anyone again, we'll throw you in jail. What ends up happening is not only do we win and the city backs off and, and let, lets them continuing to feed people, uh, but others join them and more people come out and help them to feed people and help people get back on their feet. This is what happens when we alert people to an injustice in their local, in their backyard. Not only do they help us on that cause, but and not only do they often join us in working on other causes there and across the country, but they realize that there was an, a, a greater, deeper issue that they could be helping with. You know, a, a, a family that needed help from their community, uh, people that need help getting back on their feet, and they join in that as well. So it absolutely builds community on multiple fronts. Thank you for joining me today on Kibbe on Liberty and for being part of our fiercely independent audience. Every week, my organization, Free the People, partners with Blaze TV to bring you this show. My guests bring smart perspectives on everything from current events to timeless philosophical debates. If you like what you hear, go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and support Kibbe on Liberty so we can continue to produce these honest conversations with interesting people. Now, let's get back to it. Very, very cool project, um, and I'd be happy to help any way I can. The first way we can help is by you telling us where people can get involved with You Are The Power. Yeah, so the first thing you do, go to youarethepower.net, become a member, become a part of the You Are The Power. We have free membership. Uh, we also have paid membership that helps cover costs that we that we incur. Uh, and I can tell you, we are uh, we we have a lot of people that are vetting a lot of causes and doing a lot of work. So any amount that you're able to give uh, would be incredible. But if you're either not in a position to give or you want to see what we're doing first before you give, membership is free. If you go to youarethepower.net, you can sign up to become a member today. Uh, the next thing I ask is, again, if you are able to give, please give what you can. But more importantly, lead and recruit get other people to see what it is that we're doing and encourage them to join. Start going to your local city council meetings and your county council meetings whenever you can and listen to what's happening there. And you will almost inevitably, you will find someone who is going there on their own or maybe with one or two other people supporting them, begging your local government to stop ruining their lives. Stop trying to take my home. Stop trying to take my business. Stop trying to tell me that I can't feed people who are in need. Stop trying to tear my family apart. Please, I'm begging you. And you will watch those officials sit there basically try to stay awake. They're drinking their coffee. They're chatting with each other. You talk about the banality of evil. You see it at these local government meetings. They are so disconnected from the reality of what they're doing to people. You just found your cause. You just found someone that you can help. And if you're a member of You Are The Power, bring it to us. Tell us about it. We'll vet the cause, make sure everything is that we can do something to help with it. And we'll help you. We'll signal boost your efforts. We will uh, help provide best practices. We'll help connect you with others in your local community and with our network of people across the country. We can do this. We are doing this. We do this on a daily basis now, dozens of causes at a time across the country. And we're doing it because we have come up with a viable plan that works. And it's based on something that intrinsically makes sense to at just about every other human being on earth. Respect for people as an individual human being. And if you'd like to be a part of that, go to you are the, oh, my mic's in the way. Go to youarethepower.net. 
Yeah, like we couldn't get the URL there, so that was that was a that was an issue. <laughs> so um, rookie error, rookie error. Okay, so you're going to be flooded with uh, new recruits without the impassioned pitch, and now we now we pivot to the gotcha question section of the program. Yes, um, and the first section comes from Logan in my studio. When are you going to run for president already? <laughs> so um, the short answer is I'm not sure if I am going to run. Um, I am. I, I, so first of all, I've never wanted to run. I, I, there are many people who are like, man, I, I'd like to run for president. That was never anything I wanted to do. When I ran for the VP nomination in 2020, I never thought I'd actually get it. I just wanted to use it to make a point about some of the failures I was seeing in libertarian messaging. Can, I, can we start over? Because I'm, I'm sorry. This is like, I don't know what's happening with my, with my um, screen background, but it's, it's, I'm, I'm, not sure what's happening here. We were, we were told that that background was real. Yeah. Well, yeah, that part's real, but I got some, some schmutz on the window. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what the hell is it's, happening. It's, it's literally disintegrating behind you. I'm disintegrating. Yeah. No, it's me. I'm disintegrating. The yeah. thing behind me is fine. I think it is. I'm sorry, man. If you give me one second, I think it's that the, the sun is coming in through the window a certain way or Yeah, maybe. Something. Maybe. Hold on. I usually. Don't have totally this issue, but it just, it's, it's been crazy. slowly creeping up and it's reached a point. It's probably been annoying you for quite a while, but it's reached a point where it's annoying me now. And that's what, uh, that's what matters. So, yeah, um, yeah, clearly hold on. Oh, good. It's even somehow worse. How in that for, for a, how for a that? second, it switched back to the right colors. So I don't know if it's a, I don't think it's a light thing. It's something else. It, it yeah, I'm not sure what it is. I, it is wildly annoying though. I'll tell you that. Um, and and we're totally leaving all that shit in there. By the way, <laughs> just this whole thing. That's yeah. fine. I listen. This is your show. You do what you want. Um, I, I uh, well, I guess it's gonna. Yeah, no, it is. It is a light thing. But I think there's literally. This guy will not move the sun. I've asked him multiple times. Yeah. It is somehow getting worse, and this is. <laughs> Crum I'm crumbling in front of you. Definitely right. leave all this in. Well, this, this is important to leave in. This is your first. This is, this is your very first podcast, so I understand that you're <laughs> technically confused. It's you know. Listen, I'm sure that as I podcast, is it? I think as I do more podcasts, <laughs> yeah. then it will become more fluid. You'll get it. Um, you'll get it down. So yeah, I guess you know what. Don't cut any of this. This is now canon yeah and um and i'll just i'll go back to what i was saying before yeah as i i think it got slightly better but as i crumble away it as it, thanos must have uh, snapped his fingers um yeah so I, I i i don't know if i'm running uh because well first of all i i gotta get my act together if i am gonna run but um it was nothing i ever really wanted to do um and i will do it if i determine that a better it really it comes down to what is a better use of my time between now and november understanding that the likelihood of a libertarian or anyone that isn't a republican or democrat getting elected is essentially zero could we win there's nothing legally stopping us but they're they're fighting to keep us off the ballot the the just it, it's it, the amount of struggle just to even be able to fight on somewhat of an even playing field takes up most of our efforts and it's just the likelihood's very low so it becomes okay i'm running for if i'm running for president it's to help the movement it's to spread the message it's to provide a stark alternative to voters who are so frustrated with the status quo that they don't care about if the democrat or the republican wins they just want something better and they'll vote for it and join it um if it, if you know they'll, they'll uh, join join it and vote for it because they 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 already know they're going to lose and so they might as well lose voting for something they believe in so if i'm going to do that the question becomes is it better for me to do that to take that time off from you or the power kind of put it almost in an autopilot, put a good team in place or, or leave a good team in place to continue to meet our goals and to take this time for the next however many months and and do a presidential run? Um, or is it better for me to just double, triple, quadruple down on you or the power, leave the people that are currently running, let them let them 
choose between, you know, have the delegates choose which one of them that they want, uh, support the party as I can, you know, I can still show up to events and, and things like that, but focus my attention on you were the power. And it's a decision I obviously need to make sooner than later. Um, I will say this, if I do run, I'm not running against other libertarians. I'm not going to try to convince you that I'm better than Lars or, Ch or, or, uh, or Chase or Josh or Mike or the other Mike or, you know, Jacob. First of all, these people, most of them are my friends who I've known for years. And second of all, they're all libertarians. Like if, if you think that they're a better pick than me, then go ahead and do it. If I if I get in the race, I'm not running against other libertarians. I'm running against Donald Trump and Joe Biden and I'm running against the status quo and I'm going to immediately if I do jump in the race, I'm running a front facing, essentially general election campaign to explain why libertarians have the solutions and why people should vote libertarian. And if when the convention comes around, the delegates choose to pick me, then that's great. If they say, ah, we like what you're doing, but we like what this person's doing better. Fine. Here, here's the keys to everything I built in the meantime, have at it. I'm going back to you or the power. So if I do decide to run, it is not because I'm running against anyone else that is in the race. It's because I've decided that that's the best way I can help the movement. And I will immediately start writing, fighting against the status quo from day one. Okay. We're going to leave it there just in case your studio actually catches on fire. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm not sure what you guys are doing on your end, but uh, <laughs> the gotcha was from my lighting. Yeah. It had nothing to do with you. Right. It was my lighting yeah. saying, "What are you going to do if you just crumble in front of your bi probably biggest interview to date, Matt yeah. Kibbe?" Yeah. And this is what happens. Yeah. So Incredible. like um, the flat Earth clip and and the studio just literally disintegrating in front of our eyes. These these are the things that are going to drive this interview. I hope that's what you leave in. The rest of this, you can take it, you can leave it, you make your little TikTok clips from it, whatever, that's fine. But the most important thing that people need to remember is that I don't have my act together. The literal sun can just destroy this pretense of me looking professional. Um, and that I am a, a dyed in the wool, devout flat earther who has actually added to the centuries old mythos by adding a, 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 a kind of angry eagle to the mix yeah. for no particular reason. You just gave me a third clip. So, so just stop while you're ahead. <laughs> okay. Final, final advice to people watching this. Uh, I, I consider you one of uh, Liberty's best communicators. Um, and I encourage people if they're not doing it already to follow you on X do you, if you do you know your X handle, it's Spike Cohen. Probably I don't know what it is. It's 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 at real Spike Cohen, um, and I'm all over the internet. If you look for Spike Cohen, you you can find me. I'm pretty loud. So, uh, but it is at real Spike Cohen on uh, on X. Um, still getting used to calling it X, but yeah, I'm I'm there. And uh, I guess my my final advice I would give, I will presume that most of the people watching this are already libertarians. You you have already read or at least understand. Rothbard and, and Hayek and Mises and and you, you you might have gotten here from a Ron Paul video or a, a Milton Friedman clip or like I got here from Matt Kibbe uh, Freedom Works emails from the uh, early 2000s. But however you you got here, um, however you got here, you're probably pretty solid on libertarian ideas. And I'm very often asked, like, well, what are the books I should be reading about libertarianism? And I say you should be reading How to Win Friends and Influence People by Carnegie. Um, if you're already solid on libertarianism, then if you're not solid yet on it, you know, there are plenty of people out there that are recommending economics in one le lesson and, you know, man, economy and state and, and everything else and the, the law and no trees. And those are all you know, it's great to read all that stuff or at least have an understanding of those things. Um, but if you got that stuff solid, now you got to know how to spread it to other people. And how to win friends and influence people, which is something I first read in my late teens when I was first starting a business. Um, it doesn't just teach you how to spread ideas and how to convince people that you're right or to sell something to them. It teaches you how to rethink how you're interacting with people. You're not seeing them as a means to an end. You're seeing them as a partner in something you are trying to build. And it teaches you how to become, not act like, but become a leader become someone that other people want to be around, want to emulate, and want to be a part of what you're doing. And so I, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Read it, reread it, you know, as much as it takes. Um, the next thing I'll say, and this, this might sound a little hokey, but it's an important thing to me. Um, 
the best way that you can stop from burning out, whether it's in libertarian activism or just in your personal life, and I think there are a lot of people that are experiencing a lot of burnout right now or are close to it. Um, I think one of the best ways you can you can fight that, certainly one of the ways I fight it, have fought it in the past, is through what I call active gratitude. I'm not the only person that calls it that, but it's through active gratitude. And there are many resources you can find out online about active gratitude and, and what that means and practices you can do. Uh, one thing I do, which is really simple, is uh, at the either at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, which whenever you're you're most ready to uh, to record something, uh, write down or you know type in your phone in a notes app or something like that three things that either happened that day or the day before that you are grateful for and they're unique to that day that something could be as small as you saw a really nice sunset or as big as you got a big promotion or or your your child was born whatever it is um write those things down and keep a journal of it so that you can see every day at least three things happen to you that you were grateful for um and i guess the only other advice i have is join you or the power net in my that, totally unbiased i just heard about it i think it's great and i think you should join it you were the power dot net yeah. and the, i guess my last 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 bit of of advice is if you are going to go on these podcast things make sure your lighting is worked out because the last thing you would want and i know this sounds insane it would never happen is that you would be on a, a pretty big interview with someone who has gets like rand paul and thomas massey and, and spike cohen that you would go on this show and in the middle of it probably the most important part of it your thing just starts screwing up and because matt is the kind of person he is he's a, a hundred percent going to leave that in he's going to leave all of that in including when you get up and walk around and try to figure it out and you're talking to yourself and like that's you don't want that. It will ruin everything. Don't do that to yourself. Rules for life. Thank you, Spike Cohen. It's good, ha you, good hanging out again. And uh, let's, Absolutely let's do not. this again sometime. Yes, let's please do it. Thank you, sir. Thanks for watching. If you liked the conversation, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and also ring the bell for notifications. And if you want to know more about Free the People, go to freethepeople.org.